This interview was made possible in part by a grant from Arts DFW. Hi, we're at the Kimball Art Museum with curator Jennifer Kassler Price and James Doyle, director of the Matson Museum of Anthropology, to talk about the show Lives of the Gods, Divinity in Maya Art. James and Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. The title of the show juxtaposes this idea with, of divinity with that of living and all the messiness that that implies. How did the idea of the show come together and where, um, where did the works come from? How did you organize them for the exhibition? Well, the main idea is that Maya artists from a specific time period, from about 250 to 900 AD, um, gave bodily form to natural forces like the sun, rain, lightning, maze, and other sort of concepts in their world. And they created this cast of supernatural characters that we call deities or gods. And we actually have the hieroglyph for god or godlike essence or, you know, it's, it's a complicated term in the classic Maya language. But the idea was to think about how these concepts are still relevant to many people today and how do we think of these very important parts of our lives that sometimes have supernatural creation stories or origins. The real exciting aspect of this uh, exhibition is to see almost half of the loans are from the national collections of Mexico and Guatemala. And that's a part of this rich cultural patrimony that comes from those countries. And the idea that this rich history is as elaborate and as beautiful as some of the other ancient traditions of religious art that we know better, um, like Greek and Roman or Judeo-Christian or um, Islamic, for example. So to kind of bring these deities to the forefront and bring these artists to the forefront was the main idea. And it builds from our knowledge being increased in the past decade or two of artist signatures. We can track their careers, we can track their hands in sculptures and paintings. So to really think about who were these creative individuals and what were their commission to do in these creation of supernatural characters and what was the relationship to the rulers? You know, how did that underpin their claims to political power during this time period? You know, James came here to the Kimball in 2018 with this idea for the exhibition and basically was inquiring about two of the Kimball's uh, painted vessels, Codex style painted vessels. Um, he wanted to borrow them for the exhibition and I immediately said, well, are you looking for a second venue? And would you also like to borrow the sensor stands? <laughs> and from that moment, um, we, you know, we formed this partnership with the Met and I'm just thrilled to be able to bring um, such an important show here to the Kimball, um, this assemblage of, you know, masterpiece works. Um, as James mentioned, uh, half the pieces in the show have not been seen in the U.S. Uh, several things are new discoveries. Um, it's truly a kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity uh, because many of these things I doubt will ever travel again, particularly the ones coming from Mexico and Guatemala. Um, so you'd have to go there, and instead you can come to the Kimball. So it's just really nice to carry on a tradition that the Kimball actually has, a history of presenting major exhibitions of Maya art, uh, beginning with Blood of Kings in the mid-80s, where they were just starting to break the Maya code and to actually uh, read these glyphs, which give us the names of patrons, the dates, uh, the places. Um, with Fiery Pool in 2010 that was exploring the theme of water and how important water is to Maya cosmology um, and how that's depicted in the artwork. And then now with Lives of the Gods, uh, looking specifically at how um, they portray deities, uh, the relationship between deities and rulers, how that's depicted in the artwork. Um, so it's just great to be able to feature the exhibition here and to have worked with James. The show really shows the incredible artistic achievement of the classic period. And you go from, from these uh, 
small naturalistic humorous pieces like the whistle figurine that's the old man lifting up the young girl's skirt, hashtag me too, from 3,000 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> to the formal stylized power that's present in Stila 51, the, I, can I call it a portrait of mm -hmm. Yuknum Tuk Kawil? And his, his like presence on that, on that forceful presence on that uh, stone. Um, what does that range tell us about the reasons that these works were created and what they meant to the culture that they were part of? I think the uh, scale is something you brought up and it's so forceful to see these very, very small objects that have that type of power and they would have been worn or used or held. Um, ceramic vessels, they're actually drinking and eating from them as they look at these mythological scenes and these creation stories and they were reenacting these. It was all part of the ceremony of these royal courts. So you can imagine these people just decked out in these elaborate garments that were infused with these divine images. And we can also think about, as you said, the power projecting from these stone monuments and recent decipherments by Steve Houston, Dave Stewart, some of the people that contributed to this project, you know, they are showing that the, the monuments themselves were these vivid, and living things according to the people who made them. You know, there was, a, there was a vitality to the sculptures that you can clearly see because you can see how the artists created these details down to the fingernails that we were talking about earlier. Um, that there's this sort of mortality in it, but there's always this divine gloss because they're wearing God images, they're wearing God headdresses, or they're taking God names like Yuknum Tokawil, which is saying he is the lightning god. Um, so these royal people were building these connections in their rhetoric, in their speech, in their performances, and reinforcing that with the art they were commissioning from these talented creative people. I think the other um, important thing to note is by including the artist's signature on the piece itself, whether it's a painted pottery or carved throne or a panel, the ruler is connecting himself with the artist who is you know, doing this on the highest technical level with creativity and imagination. I mean, it, it's like saying, well, Michelangelo you know, painted my Sistine <laughs> Chapel, essentially. And like when we look at the uh, throne back from Piedras Negras, uh, we see portraits presumably of perhaps a ruler and his wife, but on the same plane, uh, almost uh, in the same size are the signatures of the two sculptures. So really equal. Um, and I think that's a really interesting thing to find in works of art from any world culture in the 7th and 8th centuries. Was that practice something new that happened in the classic period or was there were there was there evidence of it prior to that? No, it's the earliest ones we see are maybe the 4th or 5th century in the classic period mm -hmm. and then um, the, we have, from Piedras Negras, for example, we have very structured atelier workshops that we see some sculptors are signing it as the head sculptor in a larger text. So there are clearly these sort of master-apprentice type relationships where, and we know the sculptors were working through generations. So we see one sculptor working for father and son, for example. Um, and so this, this practice of signing the monuments was also limited geographically at that time because we don't, we see a site like Tikal, Guatemala, dozens of stone monuments of the highest quality, zero signatures. Mm. Copan, similarly, beautiful, one of the most important sculptural workshops of the ancient world, very few signatures, but Piedras Negras, Yas Chilan, uh, Palenque, we see that we have these signatures and so what is that regional difference even? You know, why are certain artists permitted or encouraged to sign their work at this place at this time, and then in other places it's not allowed or it's not encouraged? Mm -hmm. So um, there, there are still some questions, I think. That's the other really exciting thing about this exhibition and Maya research in general is that it's ongoing. You know, these decipherments are still happening. Um, and so for people to see some of these recent discoveries, I, I would say this exhibition, bringing people to see these may even elicit more observations that could push the field forward. Right, I mean, just to point out that the identification of these artist signatures, I mean, that's fairly recent. That's in the last 10 or so years. So 
since Fiery Pool, mm -hmm. uh, we now can identify these artists. And in the exhibition, we identify them by name, you know, on the labels. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, going back to talking about scale and also diverse media, because we have everything from the miniature, uh, so these precious carved jades, shell, um, bone. obsidian, bone, uh, to the monumental uh, stele, to the painted and um, incised pottery. The, again, the, the level of technical virtuosity is high above the board. I mean, it's, it's the highest aesthetic that you will find. And it's across the board, across media, and across scale. And again, obviously, these are artists, whether, they're, whether we know their names or not, um, that they're, they're working at the highest levels of achievement in the service of the, of the uh, rulers. And we also have these glimpses of the perishable world that didn't survive. Mm -hmm. So one of the works in the show that's really exciting is a doorway lintel that is made of wood. And almost nothing from the classic period survives of wood. We have very few examples. And so to see something in wood or to see these very finely painted ceramic vessels with images of books on them, mm -hmm. we can imagine that there's, this would have been a literate, you know, really exciting place to be uh, for a creative person that we see represented in their talent in these more durable materials. So speaking of materials, um, was there particular meaning assigned to things like jade, obsidian, the limestone, and then particularly with respect to that wood panel, would that have had different kind of um, implications just because of the material it was constructed out of? Definitely. Um, the, uh, Maya artists were choosing these materials very specifically. So as far as jade, it has this green color. It has this sort of beautiful, variegated look to the surface. And so that was about maize. It's about the green sprouts coming out of the earth. It's about the blue-green water. Um, so it's agricultural fertility in a hard stone. Um, lightning was sort of thought of as causing obsidian and flint to be born in the ground, right? Um, because this fractal electricity that lights up the night sky, and you see that fractal quality in these volcanic glass or uh, flints that are sort of branching, and so they're representing that lightning in this hard material. And wood, of course, it's about the trees, right? It's about the abundance of the forests around them. And the Chico Sapote tree, which is a very dense, very large hardwood tree, was ex extremely important for architectural features, but it also would have had a symbolism for the people that used it. And they're very specific about marking things as wood in depictions of wood things. So it, it clearly had, a, it was a qualitative Thing about wood that was highly valued um, among Maya sculptors. But doesn't exist, you know, right. it's not survived. So to have uh, one of these lintels from Tikal, and I think maybe there's three, mm -hmm. um, two in Basel, Switzerland, and this one comes from Basel, and one at the British Museum. Um, it's true, again, it's truly extraordinary that we have it here. H how did it survive? It was, uh, the hard wood is actually resistant to termites and because the temple was built so well, it survived into the 19th century in situ. So it was actually in place in the doorway when um, explorers uh, at the time, Europeans arrived and you, you see that they've carved the um, sculpted surface from the beams. Um, and it was at the time an act of preservation and now they have um, survived miraculously um, any other environmental uh, or architectural or other degradation. So this throne that we mentioned earlier would have brought a celestial presence to an earthly setting and we talked about the two lords that are on there. Can you walk us through some of the other iconography we see in the carving? Who's, who's here and sure. how is it um, making its presence known? So the whole throne back is actually the face of a mountain. And so you actually see that the cutouts, this open work, represents the eyes of this mountain. The center line is actually a nose that's sort of in low relief, but you can see that it protrudes enough so that there are bones coming out of the nostril. This is a nose ornament of the mountain deity. And the mountain is wearing elaborate ear ornaments, so these kind of scalloped elements on either side of the um, 
human individuals are ear flares there. So they would have been stretched in the earlobe. So it's this idea that the mountain is alive and the mountain face is the back of this throne. So that the people represented in those mountain eyes and consequently anyone seated in front of that would be placed in this supernatural primordial mountain location. The other uh, uh, aspects on the edge of the bench as well as these trapezoidal legs those are historical texts. So it's discussing the dedication of the throne and it's sort of the activities of the ruler that commissioned it. And so that's sort of bringing this divine ethereal quality in the imagery, but really grounding it in the history and the dynastic power of these particular people. And the other important thing about the mountain in Maya mythology and in creation myths is that um, the, the mountains and specifically kind of like a mountain cave, um, that is where the gods are born, that is where they reside. So you see that depicted in other media as well. Um, sometimes it's, you know, the background like on a painted pottery, uh, you have a deity behind, it's, you know, a black background, so they're kind of like in a cave. So that's also, it's, again, the rulers are situating themselves in that mountain cave, which is, uh, you know, the home of creation. And there's traces of pigment, I think I'm making out on this. So this would originally have been multicolored. Yes, um, there's definitely red and um, orange yellow pigments that survive. And um, it definitely would have been a feature of this Acropolis at Piedras Negras where it was recovered in fragments. And it would have been brightly colored as, and probably covered in jaguar pelts or elaborately woven textiles as we see depicted on other monuments. And the colors also too um, often are symbolic. Um, I don't know if it's the case with the throne, but uh, usually when you see red, that's indicative of the sun, of the sun's rays, of the fiery kind of breath of the sun. Um, there are a few pieces in the exhibition where we find that. And then there's another color, uh, Maya blue. Uh, which is this really brilliant kind of turquoisey blue color that we find on uh, some of the painted ceramics and vestiges on some of the carved monuments. Um, this is a pigment that, um, you know, it's a, a mineral blue pigment that's mixed with a special kind of clay so that it still exists today. And we find it uh, again in the pottery. There's a couple of whistles in the exhibition that are just exquisite. Three of them depict the maize god and there are two with little aged deities and they have this Maya blue, um, again, not unlike jade, blue is sort of evocative of water, of life-giving sources, of the sea. Um, the Maya underworld is a watery place, so kind of referencing that. Um, again, water is rain. Uh, rain uh, brings the crops, so abundance. So again, you find these kind of themes throughout. Um, being expressed in different kinds of ways through the media and through colors. Mm -hmm. Elements of that divine sphere also appear, as we've talked about, on some of the ceramics. I was particularly interested in the tripod plate that shows the maze god, um, I'm sorry, the rain god in, in the mm -hmm. act of creation. Can you talk about how the artist used the kind of entirety of that vessel to tell his story, or her story, I suppose? <laughs> we don't have any signatures that are specifically marked as female individuals. There is a glyphic way for that to be expressed. Um, but I would say the potters may have been very important royal women. Um, and so we have to think about multiple hands going into something as monumental as this large plate that you mentioned. On the interior surface, which is where you would presumably place the food is such is a very elaborate scene and so we have characters around the rim of the plate that give us a sense of the place and this is happening in this there we can see where the sky is we can see that there's a clear horizon line of black water and that's actually mentioned in the text of the place of the black water is where this is happening so we see other creatures around that kind of give us this frame and this microcosm in that image in which the rain god is sort of standing in this water and from him are growing these other deities so he's this generative force and of course rain is generative but it's quite literally things are sprouting from him um, and also uh, the under the water we see the beginnings of agriculture we see the maize god we see what might be a root crop uh, this is something that um, steve houston has um, identified in this image and tobacco uh, another important crop so we see that the rain god is at the center of it all. Um, without rain, we would not have maize or tobacco or root crops. 
And so to have him there with his acts of lightning, sort of as this creation narrative full unfolds, um, is, is extraordinary in something as sort of you would think of as every day as a plate. But this is a very special plate. So it's a feasting plate, and it's a very deep dish. So, you know, probably for serving tamales. On the exterior, the artist sort of carries on the theme. Um, so on the outside rim, you have, uh, again, sort of the pictorial way of uh, depicting water. It's kind of like a water band. So it's this sort of black wash with little kind of big circle dots. Uh, then interspersed, you have uh, the conventional way of showing spondyla shells um, and other types of things that you would see in the water, in the sea. And then it's a tripod plate, so there's three rather um, thick tripod feet. And on the feet, there are little marks kind of coming down vertically, uh, representing either rain or quite possibly the water that would come down in a, a water cave, so the cenote. Uh, that may also be what's portrayed as the, the chalk is coming out of a cenote, which is uh, sacred water. It's the surface of the underworld. Um, and it's, again, carried throughout the dish on the inside and the outside. I mean, how many people would necessarily be looking underneath the plate? Right. But it, it's there. Um, so. It's the whole package <laughs> in one plate. Yeah, it's really incredible how thoroughly the artist has thought through that whole, the entire story and, and embodied it in that simple vessel. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> special. It's special. Very, very special indeed. Well, congratulations to both of you. It's a fantastic show. Thank you. I really appreciate your talking to us this afternoon. Thank My you. My pleasure. Find all of our videos and sign up for our newsletter at artthisweek.com. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter.